Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Xenosaga 3. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, clear data and uh, what we get for, uh, um, or and and explore through the uh, the data section. Um, I haven't made pointed uh, this out at all, but uh, um, there is a data option there. Uh, also, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, the singer of the ending song is Emily Curtis. Um, those of you who have watched uh, Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex and enjoyed the music for that might recognize uh, her for from doing the uh, song What's It For? Uh, which is one of my favorite songs from that show. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, continue. And if we select Game Cleared... Game Clear Bonus. Unlocked Swimsuit Mode. Unlocked Alan's Swimsuit. Press the square button when selecting the scene to switch to swimsuit mode. This mode will replay the events with the characters wearing their swimsuits. Only applies to characters with swimsuits unlocked. Congratulations! Game clear bonus. Acquired Alan's swimsuit and flawless. And we got a database update. Uh, the flawless is for chaos. No, not that. Uh, Aether Attack 20, Vitality 3, Defense 3, Special Armor that changes the character model. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. You can probably guess what that is. Yeah, it's it's his robe. Uh, but we'll, we'll take a look at that more closely in the uh, um, uh, data viewer. And Alan's swimsuit only applies for, uh, again, you know, viewing the, uh, um... Oops. The events. Um, alright, let's see... Database. By category. Update to Aoi Uzuki. Shion's mother, originally from the Bacillus system, which, despite its proximity to the Federation capital, is largely largely populated by people from the immigrant fleet. AoE is thought to possess a trait common amongst the people of Zohar of Abraxas, a compatibility with Udu, latent, latently within her. As a result of this latent characteristic, AoE became the subject of Udu observation and ultimately slipped into a coma due to the resulting stress. Alan Ridgely. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not sure what is updated. Ah, he matures, albeit gradually, through the time he spends with Xion and the others, ultimately showing his manhood by excoriating Kevin for using Xion Cosmos and brushing away the last doubts in Xion's heart. Although the distance between his and Xion's hearts has drawn noticeably closer since the incident on Mictum, his true worth as a man will be measured from here on, in how he grows closer still. Wilhelm. Um, probably should just read through all of this. Um, founder and CEO of interplanetary conglomerate Vector Industries. Having created the UMN, a giant network unifying all of space, he built facilities for hyperspace navigation. The company has become the de facto nucleus of all civilization, with a firm grasp of all the latest technology. Once the Galaxy Federation Executive Committee Director, his origins and personal history are shrouded in mystery. Furthermore, in addition to his official role, he commands the secret order of cloaked figures known as Testaments, attempting to meddle in the destinies of Xion Cosmos and the others. The only ones to understand Wilhelm's fixation with Xion Cosmos, his purpose and motivation, are the Testaments, and even they may not truly, fully un truly understand his plans. Supposedly, his office is constantly filled with the music of Wagner. Calling Chaos Yeshua and reading the movements of the Compass of Order and Chaos, he plots to change the very shape of the world. In trying to bend the movement of God ordained of the God ordained compass towards his own desired conclusion, he makes himself a traitor unto God. What he is attempting to accomplish can be inferred from the words he once spoke to Kevin as a boy, eternal recurrence. Millennia ago, when the will of humanity resonated with Chaos's power of anima, the failsafe of the universe, the universe's destruction was ordained. Wilhelm chose to chose eternal recurrence through Zarathustra as a means of averting that destruction. 
rewinding time to the past and living in an eternal cycle. Vector Ormus, the Testaments, and finally Cosmos and Shion. He waited until the moment that all the necessary factors were lined up. It is unsure whether the current cycle is the tenth reoccurrence, or even the hundredth, but the distortions created by the repetition gradually changed people's consciousness. Ultimately, mankind rejected his power, choosing to progress to the future by their own will. So again, this is one of those things that could be a re uh, could be construed as um, Xenosaga existing in Xenogears' future. Just commenting. Oh, I... Yes, it was the, the, uh... In fact, well, let's finish this up. While his methods differed from Xion's, Wilhelm undoubtedly sought to save the world just the same. Or perhaps what he truly wanted was a revolution in mankind's consciousness, brought about by the cyclical reoccurrence of time. Uh, let's see... Was it weapons? No. Unknown? Where are the Omegas? Nope. Hmm. Ah. Omega metempsychosis. Um. It is thought that the Omega existed in a form similar to this configuration during the Lost Jerusalem era. That, right there, is what I meant. That could be construed as inferring that Lost Jerusalem is not actually Earth, but the uh, um, planet of Xenogears. And of course, that is the form uh, that Deus took at the very end of Xenogears. Modified for this game, of course. I still think it's a... Um I don't think it's intentional. I mean, well, not intentional. I mean, obviously, it's all intentional. I, I think that... I don't think it's intended that this actually does exist in uh, Xenogears' future. But... Because technically, Xenogears exists in our future, too. Uh, let's see. Chaos. He is the human incarnation of Anima, a power derived from the collective unconscious and present since the beginning of the universe in this dimension. Uh, that's, that's all Jungian, although completely reinterpreted for the uh, purpose of this game. His powers act as a failsafe for all of dimensional space. As the release of his powers would mean the destruction of dimensional space, his powers were divided up into parts by his antithesis, Mary Magdalene, Animus, in the distant past. Um, Anima is supposedly like the feminine portion that exists within men, and Animus is the masculine portion that exists within women in Jungian psychology. Um... I don't fully get it. It's not like getting in touch with your inner feminine side kind of thing. It's it's more abstract than that, and using the terminology can be a little bit confusing by today's standards kind of thing, but I don't know. It's been a while since I read much on Jungian, and I never really mu read much. Chaos regained his former powers through Cosmos' awakening and left the possibility of a future in the hands of Abel, Udu, that chose to remain in this lower dimension. Chaos unleashed the power of Anima, performing a dimensional shift with Nephilim, the recipient of Mary's power, leading the consciousness of mankind to lost Jerusalem. And see, this is the other thing. It could also be interpreted that the ending of Xenosaga, Xenosaga leads into Xenogears. This is going right back to, you know, okay, the the uh, uh, reoccur the eternal reoccurrence, the uh, eternal cycle, uh, Alpha and Omega. It can be interpreted that they're looping. He still exists as the universe's failsafe. Because of his fate ordained by God, or perhaps because people struggling against their own fates desire his existence, his future form still lies within the chaotic darkness. But chaos continues to believe. The future will be born illuminated by the radiance of consciousness. Kevin Winnicott, central figure to the Cosmos Project, Joint Operation Gion, uh, blah, 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 okay. Um, where is the update? 
A native Mictum, he escaped by the hand of his fatally injured mother when the planet was destroyed as a result of the Zohar going out of control. Several years later, while at the CSRC during university, Kevin transferred along with, the, with Joachim to the Utic organization, where he completed the initial planning of Cosmos on his own. After the Milshin conflict, he took the fundamental theory behind Cosmos and joined Vector. The surname Winnicott is from the foster parents who took him in after his escape from Mictum. It is unknown whether Kevin is his true given name or not. Regardless, it remains true that as a native of Mictum, inheritor of the blood of the Braxis, his lineage is steeped in deep connection to the Zohar. Kevin Winnicott Child. Um, ah, uh, TC 4747. Following the destruction of planet Mictum, a resource recovery ship rescued a young boy assumed to have escaped in a pod. Upon hearing of a survivor, the Federal Accident Investigation Committee attempted to question him regarding the details of the accident, but the boy was unable to recount much due to the shock of the tragedy, and the committee's efforts ended in naught. Eventually placed in an orphanage, he was quickly accepted by foster parents, thanks to his keen intelligence. The surname Winnicott was taken from these parents. He refused to mention anything except for the name Kevin, and his original surname is unknown. Reports from the orphanage confirm that he carried a pendant through thought to be a memento of his mother. His foster parents died in the ensuing Milshin conflict, in which realians across the galaxy went berserk. Kevin's mother. Um, she became a gnosis at the time of Mictum's destruction. The pendant passed on from Kevin to Shion was originally a possession of his mother. Its composition the same as that of Mictum's underground ruins, Zarathustra, which leads one to believe that either she or her husband were not only descendants of the people of Zohar, but in addition had a deep connection with the ruins. Cosmos Archetype. Um... Kevin, needing to die in front of Xion's eyes, had secretly installed a program into the archetype, causing it to go out of control. The program was later engaged via the startup key, which Kevin had given to Andrew. Uh, Andrew Trenkov. So, yeah. He orchestrated that. Cosmos. With the blue eyes. Uh, why were Cosmos's repairs that took place on the Milsha of the past within Xion's deep memory a type of imaginary space reflected in the real world? One reason is the fact that actions in one portion of the UMN, the deep memory, that is to say, the collective unconscious, are equivalent to those in the real world, according to one definition, where the difference... Oops. Oh, you can actually, uh... page down that way. Did not know that. After all this time... Um... Where was I? Are equivalent to those in the real world, according to one definition, where the difference is strictly subjective brought about by the Observer's recognition of it as such. Though Cosmos awakened as Mary Magdalene as a result of Telos's defeat, Mary's original memories and characteristics have undergone a transformation, leading to the creation of an entire new, entirely new personality which is both Mary and not Mary at the same time. This is fundamentally analogous to Sakura's transformation into Mogo, Momo. The, the battle over, Cosmos falls into an eternal sleep and drifts like the passage of time through the emptiness of space, a blue light penetrates her battered and faded figure. Perhaps that light will be the cause of a new awakening. Shion Uzuki. Only a few people know that she has a congenital unique sense that has allowed her to see into imaginary space since early childhood, impossible for most people. The holographic glasses she wears were a present from Kevin during her time at Vector. They served not to correct her vision, but to control this ability. However, as this sense of hers is not active all the time, and she has gotten used to it, she removes the glasses when they present an inconvenience to her daily life. Her consciousness has existed since the time of Lost Jerusalem as the Maiden, when she enjoyed a close relationship with Mary Magdalene. Her brief vision of the distant past was not through Cosmos's memory, but through her own. It can be deduced from Cosmos's last words, that Xion's former self died as a result of being caught up in some larger occurrence, and that Cosmos, Mary, had been unable to protect her. After discovering Alan's feelings for her on Mictum, Xion took the first step towards her independence. Xion, for whom Kevin's existence was so large that it had occluded Alan's feelings for her until then, 
might have felt that Alan, who lived in a world entirely opposite from her own, could better provide her heart a place of respite than Kevin, whose circumstances mirrored her own. A traveler headed to lost Jerusalem, the end of a journey spanning thousands upon thousands of years, setting out from a new dawn to rebuild the world. The intersection of countless consciousnesses and what awaits them here. Ziggy. I think that's, uh... It is possible that Ziggy's heart knew peace for the first time after Voyager was sent away after the destruction of Mictum. No one knows how much longer his brain will survive. However, for as long as he can, he'll do what he was unable to do before, dedicate his life to protecting those he cares about. Such was his promise to his departed friends. Doesn't really mention it here, but I get the I got the impression that uh, he, Yuli, and Momo essentially form a family. Jin Uzuki. Well, he shared a deep connection with Pelligree during his time in the Federation military, they never walked the same path again due to differences in their relative stations. It is particularly sad. Uh, it is a particularly sad conclusion, considering that his mother, Aoi, like Pelligree, had inherited the bloodline of the immigrant fleet, and the same blood clearly ran through Jin. Though his life was lost defending chaos in the Zarathustra battle, his spirit, his consciousness, travels alongside Nephilim to the distant land of lost Jerusalem. Perhaps his consciousness, like those of countless others, lies in, a, in sleep eternal, awaiting the appointed day, until a time when all has gathered. Perhaps he will be known as Seton. Uh, Sergius the Seventeenth. Uh, Sergius, like all people of the Zohar, possessed the ability to make contact with the faint waves put out by the Zohar. But as an Ormus patriarch, his power was stronger than normal. It is believed that this is what allowed him to control Proto Omega remotely. However, his powers were not as fully awakened as those of the, the test subjects kept in Labyrinthos, who had made direct contact with Udu. Telos. And again, I want to point out that uh, it, go back to uh, the initial infiltration of the Utik ship with uh, um, in Xenosaga 1 with Junior. And there's a screen that talks about a battle android and the name Telos is on, on it. So this was... The, Telos was planned from the very beginning. Over 80% of the body structure is based on the reanimated body of Mary Magdalene, recovered from Renla Chateau, and thus can be rightly described as flesh and blood. The reason why Telos nevertheless vastly surpasses Cosmos version 3 is because Telos interfaces directly with the UMN, regulating the material domain data. Intending to assimilate the consciousness of Cosmos, the half of Mary that exists in imaginary space, and become a, a single whole, Telos is instead defeated by the awakened Cosmos. The name Telos is a derivation, is derived from the ancient Greek word for the ultimate state of being or limitless power. Nephilim, the illusionary girl who repeatedly appears before Shion with the sound of a chime. She existed as a human during the era of Lost Jerusalem. Again, could be a reference to Ellie. At that time, the Zohar was excavated from Lake Turkana and shipped to Toronto, Canada, where its analysis began. After it had been discovered that the Zohar produced tremendous energy in response to a specific brainwave wavelength, everyone had become fixated upon finding them a method to extract it. Systems programmer Grimoire Verum completed the control program Lemageton based on the ancient language that had been unearthed from the same ruins as the Zohar. The system went out of control during a control experiment, and the young girl participating in the experiment became the first to disappear. The disappearance phenomenon continued to expand, eventually erasing all of Earth from dimensional space. The girl who disappeared at this time was none other than Nephilim. From the fact that the girl's disappearance coincided with the appearance of Abel, it can be deduced that the two share a cause and, and effect relationship. Essentially being the reverse of uh, the situation um, in Xenogears, where uh, the young child Abel encounters the Zohar and projects upon it uh, the form of Ellie. The Song of Nephilim is the result of amplifying the wavelengths created by Lemageton through the use of a giant tuning fork. 
That system was designed and built by Joachim Mizrahi. So again, that is one of the re you know that and the the fact that it talks about Toronto, Canada. Um, have fun there, Zerval. Uh, is you know why I think the references to you know the 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 possible interpretation that this could be the future or the past of Xenogears is just that their their references, their homages, their Easter eggs. Mary Magdalene. A black-haired woman who lived long ago in Lost Jerusalem. She divided up and sealed away Chaos's power as Anima. In the story, she is called the Partner of the Messiah, though it is unknown whether she is actually the historical figure of Mary Magdalene. Judging from her words to Shion in the story, she likely shared some bond with her in her past life. There's a whole hell of a lot of Marys in, in the New Testament and the uh, uh, Apocrypha uh, that that are named Mary. It's 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 crazy. Pretty damn common name. Um, Mary being the female form of Marius. It's kind of how the Romans did it. They they took a male's name and just added female ending. It's kind of creepy when you really think about it. Um, what is new here? I think that's all new. Though she was given the bodily appearance of a child by Yoki Mizrahi, this is only a temporary measure until the final adjustments can be made to her function functionalities. She was designed to be transferred from her current body once its capabilities and central nervous system central nervous network are completed, allowing her the possibility of growing into an adult woman in the future. The transgenic type is a hybrid of human genes and ALC al alcumia. Essentially, the genes of the realians. Consequently, Momo, in her finalized form, shares an affinity with human cells and would potentially be able to conceive a child. Regular 100 series multi-observational realians have only their antinosis capabilities in common with Momo. As products manufactured by the Galaxy Federation government, their abilities are similar to those of regular realians, making Momo an entirely unique entity. Momo, left at the dawn of a new era after the events at Mictum, began to work with Ziggy, Yuli, and the others in order to rebuild the world. Firm in, their, in her belief that the construction of a new network was one path to saving the world. She believed that such a network promised a reunion with those who had already departed. Joachim Mizrahi. Uh, what is new? <clears throat> At the time of the Federation's third descent operation on Milsha, Joachim forced the Song of Nephilim into overload. He cut the connection between Milsha and its surroundings and the UMN in order to contain the, the expansion of the sudden Gnosis phenomenon and the Zohar, <coughs> the cause of the, the conflict to Milshan space. Though he was supposedly a madman, had Joachim not contained things in this way, the Gnosis phenomenon would likely have spread at an accelerated pace and have reached all regions of the galaxy much earlier. I think that's the same. What is, uh... Now, Joachim, who had been born on Abraxas, founded the Utic organization after being contacted by the secret society Ormus. He was subsequently engaged in the reconstruction of the Song of Nephilim, known as the Invention of Madness, and the, and the development of proto Merkaba and the 100 series observational units. Is that... I feel like that's... I don't know. I feel like most of that is, uh, not new. So I'm not sure what was new. Uh, 100 series observational unit. That's all, I, I recognize all of that. I don't know what's new here. I literally do not know what was new there. That all looked old. So it was probably just like one tiny little thing. Uh, Archon Cathedral...
Uh, maybe it's this part. The above ground building is a place for the religious faith of the immigrant fleet populace, but underground lies a Zohar research facility staffed by Ormus researchers. In the heart of the underground ruins, there exists a room made of a crystalline material that only Ormus cardinals are allowed to visit. Yeah, I think that's the new part. Actually, you know what? Um... Ah, okay. It is said to have been, have its beginnings with the ancestors of the immigrant fleet who first drif drifted to this planet. Within a giant crack in the earth, they discovered underground ruins believed to be related to the Zohar. Here, they built a facility to research both the ruins and the Zohar. Alright, so that existed before they uh, uh, colonized it, which is interesting. Uh, Renle Chateau. The spherical landmass that appears in the story is not a chunk of land from Lost Jerusalem floating in space. It just appeared that way after the Renle Chateau part made a direct spatial attachment to the area of space near Mictum. This happened when Lost Jerusalem, which had been shrunk down to Planck scale levels, returned to normal space together with the appearance of Abel's Ark. However, as Renle Chateau's spatial continuity has been cut off from Lost Jerusalem, it cannot strictly be defined as a part of Lost Jerusalem. A, to a tomb lies deep inside. Kevin collected the restored and restored the body of Mary, M of Mary that was resting within, turning it into Telos. As an aside, Renle Chateau is the name of a small village in the south of France. Said to be the home of Mary Magdalene, it is the source of many legends and traditions, including stories about the bloodline of Jesus and the Holy Grail. Whether the Renle Chateau in the story is the same place as the real-life Renle Chateau is unclear. Uh, probably not, and I'm pretty sure that those uh, um, uh, stories about Mary Magdalene are probably very late era. Or maybe not very late era, but they're, they're well, they're, they're late. They're late. They're not. They're later editions. Um. But do, do. What is new here? God, I hate it when there's like a little tiny bit that gets changed. Um, I literally do not know what is new here. And nothing looks new there, so I'm not going to even read it. Uh, organizations. Immigrant Fleet. Uh, let's see. One of the space fleets that escaped Earth when Lost Jerusalem disappeared. During an extended period of nomadic existence, the fleet's scope expanded and split apart, and each splinter fle fleet emigrated to a newly discovered settlement area. At the start of the TC-4000s, TC it reunited with another fleet that had escaped from Earth, a group that had already formed a united organization of nations in the form of the Galaxy Federation. The two groups began mutual exchanges, but their historical backgrounds and cultural disparities were too much, of a, too much to bridge. Most importantly of all, the immigrant fleet was in possession of the Zohar. This led to a history of wars and truces that, had, that has repeated itself countless times. In the story, the immigrant fleet is mostly perceived as identical to Ormus, but this is not always true. The influence of Ormus doctrine has been diluted among, amongst some immigrant fleet splinter groups, and many have begun their own form of self-rule. These groups have advanced a policy of reconciliation with the, with the Federation, and they would later join the Federation organization. It would appear that the immigrant fleet does not consist entirely of pious worshippers swearing allegiance to Ormus. Ormus. Um... The general te term for the religious order that unites the immigrant fleet. It has an organiz uh, organizational structure resembling the Vatican of the Middle Ages. Although, again, considering that it uses patriarchs, that's not uh, Catholic. Uh, it was established long ago during the Lost Jerusalem era, and already existed as a group of a by approximately AD 40. Its main goal was to protect the sacred relics and the words of God that had been left by the Messiah. It holds different doctrines taken from the world religions that would later break off from it, and carries out its own set of sacraments. So again, it's pretty clearly uh, indicated that uh, um, uh, Ormus is not actually... Uh, 
you know, from uh, Catholicism, it's pretty clearly from the, Gnos uh, the Gnostic uh, faiths, which, of course, were declared as heretical, and etc., etc., etc. All right, that's about the only thing there. A uh, no, lot of stuff here. Vessel of Anima. The Vessel of Anima is, so to speak, half of Chaos's body. Chaos himself is something like a fail-safe device for the universe. In other words, when the consciousness of space begins to go out of control, Chaos has the ability to expunge it, along with space itself. The Anima is the expression of that power. Long ago, half of Chaos's body, the Anima, was decoupled from Chaos by Mary, and made into the Vessels of Anima. This saved the world from destruction, but also ca caused half of Mary's body, the Animus, to be dispersed across the area of the collective unconscious. In other words, the UMN. Abel's Ark. A perceptual phenomenon that is the lower dimensional tangible form of the imaginary space consciousness of the higher dimensional being Udu, Abel. It is a perceptual phenomenon in the same way that the Gnosis are but it is also a completely different form of existence. Abel's Ark, Udu, observed Albedo's consciousness during the fall of Old Milsha. It later took in the Zohar as a connection point in order to more steadily observe the lower dimension. After Shion's awakening, the Ark's imaginary space transformation accelerated, reflecting the consciousness of mankind, detecting the operation of Zarathustra, an anti-higher dimensional system constructed ages ago. It took the planet Mictum into itself. This action was not only was not taken in an attempt to destroy Zarathustra, it was purely trying to observe the changes in the consciousness of the lower dimension. Yes, Asher. Chaos and Junior's unit, customized for Junior's use. A versatile unit capable of handling both ground and air combat, it is prepared with weaponry that can handle all aspects of battle. It is equipped with the Erde Kaiser's generator as an auxiliary unit. Though Auxiliary, the generator, originally finely tu fully tuned to operate the Erde Kaiser, outputs a ludicrous amount of power, enough to operate all weaponry trouble-free at full spec without a vessel of anima. As it escaped from Zarathustra, the Asher restarted itself through this generator, despite having lost its vessel of anima. The generator is also outfitted with a self-destruct device to keep its secrets protected. No mention of it actually blowing up. E.S. Judah, the only one that we never actually fought. Kevin's unit. Its forte is close-range mobile combat. Again, not that we saw it. It is equipped with two knives that can directly access the UMN's physical phenomena structure in order to cut any material presence in two, making it practically impossible to, to defend against. The only countermeasure is to access the UMN's structure in the same way as Kevin, and to block it over there. However, that is only possible for those limited few with that ability. In other words, those qualified to pilot ES units. Consequently, one can see battles between ESs less as involving direct combat between physical phenomena, the material world, and more as essentially attacking and defending in the world of consciousness. Inquisitors. Um, hmm. I don't know that any of that is actually new. Gnosis. Non-physical beings that exist in another dimension, perceived as aliens from the viewpoint of mankind. Ordinarily, they have not materialized, so physical attacks do not affect them. When they have ma materialized, they... Their constituent matter seems to consist of things like water and sodium hydroxide. Why such matter would hold hostility against the human race is unclear. Well, we're mostly water, too. They have many types of external appearances. For the sake of convenience, they have been named after mythological creatures. Since they exist in imaginary space cut apart from, their, from normal phenomena, all attacks on them using current weaponry based on the laws of physics are ineffective. Okay, I'm pretty sure we've read that part. Space in this world is made up of normal space and imaginary space, placed on top of each other. If you picture normal space as matter or the body, then imaginary space can be seen as consciousness or the mind. The word gnosis refers to all forms of existence in imaginary space. All things, not just humans, have an imaginary space component, so things like the gnosis planet, which appears in the story, also exist. In imaginary space, all consciousness is in a state of full awareness allowing things like another person's animosity, for example, to be directly experienced. 
If a human comes into contact with a fear held by imaginary space and chooses to escape or reject it, he or she is nosified. At first, it would appear that they can act in groups, but each one moves with its own consciousness of rejection, dissipation, and proliferation. They could be seen as wandering in search of a kind of salvation. One could say that this consciousness of rejection and dissipation is putting all of space in peril. Wilhelm is attempting to concentrate all of this, the negative consciousness of mankind, into Zarathustra, and to awaken the eternal reoccurrence in order to return once again to the world mankind hoped for. Thirteenth Key the words Telos uttered to Cosmos, it is believed she used the words in reference to a key that is indispensable to Wilhelm's mission, the thirteenth key related to the awakening of the twelve vessels of Anima and the final stage of Mary's revival. Compass and or of Order and Chaos uh, The Compass of Order and Chaos has the ability to display the flow of consciousness in the entire universe through Zarathustra acting as the terminal point on Mictum. Wilhelm used the Compass of Order and Chaos to transmit the data collected by Program Kanan to Zarathustra. Zarathustra! A device created by people in ancient times. The giant compass-like object is something like a control terminal. The main body is actually the crystalline structures that spread out beneath the surface of Mictum. Xion's pendant, which has the, sa has the same structure, is its control key. It was originally created with the goal of invading the world, the world of God, but Wilhelm who has the role of protector of lower dimensional space, bringing lower dimensional space to its conclusion, added its functionality as an eternal reoccurrence device. In order to set off eternal recurrence, one must have control over the power of God, the power of chaos, the awakening of each anima, as well as the guidance of Mary, who shares an emotional bond with chaos, has all been for this purpose. As observational terminals for God, Abel and the Ark, i.e. Udu, need to be sealed in lower dimensional space. Consequently, the ability to induce them toward Zarathustra can also be added. Testament. Wilhelm's aides each wears a different color of cloak. They are the post-death form of Kevin and the others. However, they are not reincarnations, but beings that have slipped the bonds of normal space. Oh, so they're Ator in, uh, um, cave dwellers. Their bodies. They can exert the abilities of accessing normal space from imaginary space, their consciousness, and controlling its physical phenomena at will. By controlling physical phenomena, they also act directly upon the perception of those in normal space. You could see them as if they were actually there, even though your retinas would not be receiving any photons. Since they act directly upon the perception of their target, they will not appear in photographs or videos that rely on the action of photons, though they can act on those devices to appear in them. Once long ago, a group of people that re reacted purely to Chaos's anima power, whether these were previous incarnations of Jin, Virgil, and Voyager, or the consciousness of people of other people entirely is unclear, guided the world to destruction. Hmm. Why Jin? Alright, if Jin's inclusion there is a reference to Seton, who would Voyage, Virgil and Voyager be in, uh... the case of, uh... Xenogears? Hmm... I'm trying to fit who they might... Who I mean, who has personalities like that? I'm going to have to think about that. To form an anti-existence to these... See, I mean, again, I you know... I, I, I think that this is more of a... an homage to Xenogears than a direct reference. But, the fact that Jin is there makes me think that it is talking about Xenogears. I mean, they could be doing the meta thing of, you know, the, this this series of games was essentially designed to be a retelling of the uh, basic story of Xenogears. Um, I mean, in both, we uh, stood up against uh, quote-unquote God, in this case, uh, Wilhelm, and 
uh, Zarathustra. I mean, I don't think that Virgil and Voyager would be um, references to any of the party members. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that some more. Um, one of them could be Ramses, but I don't know. It doesn't seem to quite fit. To form an anti-existence to these people who reacted purely to the power of anima, the fail-safe of the universe, the consciousness of people were controlled and made to enter opposed phase, resulting in the birth of the Testaments. Wilhelm does not need to shift everyone into opposed phase in order to achieve his goal. Once the mass had reached a certain critical mass, everything else will have their phases shifted in a certain reaction. The current Testaments are that certain critical mass. Wilhelm has forged a certain pact with the Testaments. This serves not just to have them do whatever he wishes, but also to supplement Wilhelm's temporal reoccurrence ability. Just as the failsafe needs the power of anima to work, Wilhelm also needs the power of the opposed phase anima. Mary will serve as the fuse to ignite that power. The rendezvous which Virgil shared with Febronia was everything to his existence. He wanted to feel that moment forever. He is who he is today thanks to Febronia's death. This is what he believed. Wilhelm presented Virgil with that eternal time. He also presented Albedo with the ability to make his original wish come true. On the surface, Albedo appeared to act only on the desire to destroy, but this was a form of separation anxiety. Essentially, his real desire was to integrate with Junior. Oh, which I should also point out, at this point in the story, Junior, I believe Junior should be able to age, normally. And I think that might be part of what he was talking about with Momo, about uh, uh, Albedo waking up. I think that was a reference to them becoming integrated once he becomes in his adult form. Uh, Junior's destiny was to be used as a pawn in Dimitri's elimination of Udu. One wonders if Albedo knew that all knew that all along. Albedo's desire to unite with Junior was a form of protective consciousness in action. With the power of a testament, he could face off against Dimitri to protect Junior and ultimately realize his original goal of sharing a consciousness with Junior and gaining eternal rest. This is what Wilhelm presented to him, and that is what made him act. Proto Merkaba. Uh, let's see. Um, it can take in Gnosis, convert them to energy, and use that energy as a weapon. If it were, if it were ever actually used, it has enough power to wipe out a combined fleet instantly. Joachim actually used this ability not as a weapon, but to resurrect his daughter's consciousness within Momo. Song of Nephilim. One of the devices made by the late Joachim is... Blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's... Pretty sure that's all the same. Uh, the Song of Nephilim are the words of God that were recorded in the Y data, one of the relics. A man named Grimoire Verum analyzed these words to create the program no known as Lemageton. Joachim reconstructed a fragmented version of this. Uh, that's, that's the same. The song itself does not have the power to summon the Gnosis. Um, I think that is new. The Gnosis appears simply because a door has been opened into imaginary space as a result of Udu activating in response to people who have made fragmentary co contact with it through the song. In fact, the Gnosis that appeared around Milsha were actually caused by a fearful and isolated young Xion linking with Udu and bringing the Zohar into operation. Proto-Omega uh, Let's see... Um, again, I'm, I'm not really sure what's, uh, what's new. So whatever. Uh, pendant, a crystal pendant worn by Xion, originally a memento of Kevin's mother, who died when he was young. It was given to Xion by Kevin. It appears to have a pink object buried inside of it, making it no ordinary crystal. This object is a petal from a flower Kevin raised together with Xion as a child. He sealed it 
into his mother's memento as a cherished memory of his time with Xion. One can sense the strength of Kevin's feelings for Xion from this. I guess. I don't know. I don't see it. Um, Maiden of Mary, past life of Xion. From the term's nuances, it can be guessed that she played some kind of supporting role in the abilities of Mary. It is thought that Xion's affinity with the Zohar doesn't originate from the blood she inherited from her mother, Aoi, so much as it is a peculiarity of Xion herself, from the emotional bond she shared with Mary during the Lost Jerusalem era. Joshua. A unit owned by Wilhelm. At first glance, it looks like an ES, but it is a fundamentally different mobile weapon. It is not installed with a vessel of anima, but instead operates on an energy supply received directly from Wilhelm. Though it is a mobile weapon, it is also the main reactor of the Damarong, and it functions as the core of Zarathustra's control system. So how did the Damarong continue to function after... How did they... How did they get the Damarong to work again? Well, I mean, I suppose... It is an enormous, like, colony-sized ship, so maybe they, uh, um, just had, uh, other sub-generators that they could work together or something like that. While the ESs were constructed based upon data from the Relics of God, the Joshua is a brand new craft, constructed by Wilhelm himself. Uh, the Joshua can therefore be called half of Wilhelm's body. When operated as a mobile weapon, its combat power far exceeds that of an ES. But it also carries a weak point. When operating as Zarathustra's control system, its functionality and combat power are greatly restricted. Which is apparently why we were able to fight it. Lemageton. A Zohar control program that can be that can create certain specific wavelengths, specified wavelengths, constructed by vector programmer uh, Grimoire Verum during the Lost Jerusalem era. These wavelengths affect not just Zohar operation, but also apparently the appearance of Gnosis. Grimoire used the wavelength to control Gnosis and set off Gnosis terrorism incidents. Limageton was fragmented into pieces during the Milshin conflict and was later scattered across the UMN. Half a year ago, Grimoire... Okay, that's that's new. I mean, that's old. Whatever. Uh, in fact, Limageton is part of the ancient words that were left behind by a certain ma man. Words that Grimoire analyzed and made into a program. The man who left behind these words several thousand years ago is Chaos. And why data? Uh, in actuality, the data is a record of the words of God as inscribed by a person in ancient times. Times. Joachim's analysis of these words was what enabled him to produce a multitude of research findings. Part of the recorded data includes UMN transport code uh, for Old Milsha, closed off 15 years ago. Is is recorded inside the data. Okay, that seems redundant. Someone who obtained this code could not only be able to gate jump to Old Milsha again, but would also be able to obtain the original Zohar sleeping on Mi Old Milsha. Alright, that's normal. That's old. Alright, I think that's all old. Alright, so that's basically all of the updates. And that took a little bit longer. I completely forgot that that was going to be a thing. Um, so... I don't know, maybe I'll I'll put this on after the uh, um, the data viewer, because people are going to be more interested in that, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, I'll call this an episode here. Uh, maybe I'll put them up on the same day. I don't know. Something will happen. We'll figure it out. See you next time, everyone.